Hello, I'm Jimmy Gallagher and welcome to the Scott Penn Annual Gathering Catch-Up event. We're looking at international engagement today and we've got a fantastic panel who are going to take you through different aspects of that topic. How do you form international partnerships? How do you take into account the cultural and religious sensitivities of communities abroad? All that and much, much more. <laughs> Thanks, Annette. Third panellist now, let's say hello to Mahmoud. Hello. Uh, so, Edward, we're, we're going to come back to you now and hear just a little bit more about the work that you're doing and what international engagement really means to you from your position. So, Edward, back to you. Hey, more successful at our muting this, this time around. Um, hello again, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off with a bit of a story. Um, so I'm, I'm based in Malta. Malta is a very small island. It's 27 kilometers long, um, 216 square, square, square kilometers in its whole area. It has half a million population. Um, so really not a very big space. Also, it's an island, an island in the middle of a sea. So international engagement, international collaborations, international networks are really key for me. Um, my own personal development, but also um, in order for our work to have more relevance. And um, I'll start off with the um, STEAM summer school. So that, where did that idea come, come from? That basically came from um, a conversation that was had um, at a conference. So it was the ease of conference. I think it was held in 2014 in Copenhagen, um, having uh, social networking drinks. Um, I talked to some people in Germany, Greece there, and they were like, um, the field of science communication does not have an international um, school intensively training people for um, science communication. And also um, it was just that conversation over drinks that led to um, me exploring uh, with these people. So we had collaborators in, in Greece, in Germany, in um, Finland, and um, in the UK also, um, which is where I was trained as a science communicator at, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I don't know if you know, if people know her, um, Heather Rea, uh, Elizabeth Stevenson, um, these were the people I started off with, and it was amazing that then I was asking them to join this project, which they wholeheartedly agreed. And uh, that's one major point that I'd like to um, emphasize to, pe to, to, to people here, is EU projects are a great way to encourage collaborations. Um, they kind of are designed to force you to do so. Uh, what I applied for was for uh, Erasmus Plus Key Action to Strategic Partnership. And the idea is to exchange information between companies, institutions, and, and so on. Um, and we wrote this EU project for Erasmus Plus, and we came in, if I remember correctly, second. And then they managed to find some extra money and, and actually funded us, um, which was great. Um, and that may gave us a reason to visit each other, to brainstorm with each other, to come up with a new intensive science communication course for students and professionals that combined the arts and creativity within that. And that collaboration, um, the project ended in 2018, but we're maintaining it um, through a social enterprise model. So if any of you are interested, I can give some, some links um, uh, at, at the end of my, my talk and also share some videos about it. Um, we're, we used to run it as a real world event. Now we're wanting to digitize, obviously, because of the COVID-19 situation, which I see. Okay, so we've all had to cancel loads and loads of our events, which are really, really painful, but it's also an opportunity for us. So one thing is um, do look out for EU projects. Um, uh, there's Cost Actions, there's um, Horizon, there's Erasmus+. Plus. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the situation is going to be with Brexit, obviously. We're still waiting to find out. Um, hopefully they still reach some agreement that allows 
um, UK part partnerships to to occur also. Um, but um, despite everything, despite all of that, um, I am collaborating, for example, through other ways with other org organizations. Through, for example, so one was through EU projects force you to work to, together. You can be from all these different 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 countries. Another one was and needed no additional funding at all was through social media, for example. We had led back in 2018, um, there used to be an application called Tunnel Blick that allowed you to organize um, and coordinate tweets. And we coordinated one for European Researchers Night and it got a, a million hits and made European Researchers Night tweet, I'm um, sorry, trend back then. And now we're hoping to create videos and gather videos from all around Europe um, in order to create an international video um, that is based on maybe some serious questions, some quirky questions, and um, uh, we've all agreed. So we're about five different European researchers nice, that have agreed to film our researchers, um, we'll do the video editing, and then we'll all put it online and share it. And by doing this together, we're going to get a lot more reach and engagement. Um, we're also trying to coordinate um, various activities and events between different countries. And that international aspect is really important. There are issues with language and so on, but I think it's, um, um, we can use English, we can use sub subtitling with a bit of extra effort, you can manage to overcome them. And for me, what was really, really vital with these international engagements is what you learn from how other people carry out these projects. Um, and I think I'm running a bit out of time, so I'll tie things up with um, do get involved in international networks. I'm part of UC, um, the European Science Engagement Association. Um, they're really, really nice um, to have these virtual platforms, real world platforms to meet and share ideas with other professionals in the field. And uh, I really believe in giving your resources freely. If anyone wants to contact me, if anything I've said seems, seems, seems interesting, do get in touch. Uh, another example I want to give is through this um, STEAM summer school, we worked with some of our participants to create um, online, um, sorry, experiments people can download, which have narrative, um, research questions in them and so on. And we were a relatively small EU project. We're trying to give as many of these activities to UC, for example, to put them on their website because they've created a science engagement platform. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, um, do ask. Yes. Um, as SciComm uh, or public engagement different in other countries? So it, from a European perspective, let's stick with a European perspective just now. Is there a clash? Is there a kind of shared understanding? Is there any kind of consensus amongst EU partners, would you say, Edward? The pleasures of unmuting quickly. Um, ye yes, um, there's definitely a shared understanding. Uh, you see a lot of goodwill basically in science com communicators, um, the willingness of coming together, of working together. We all have our unique and different realities um, and how things are run can be very different as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Edward. And now on to our second panelist. Let's say hello to Annette. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks, Edward, for recommending uh, UC. And uh, well, when starting, I would like to show you three slides so that you get an impression of our network and how we work and what kind of people you will meet there. And uh, so I will start sharing my screen. It's only three slides. So just don't worry about too many pictures here. Uh, okay, let's see. Can you see it? Okay. So this is us, this is UC. You can see us uh, at a lunch break at a, a UC annual conference in Tartu, Estonia. And here you can see a bit of the spirit of this network. So these are all colleagues doing the stuff that you are doing. So the moment you enter the European Science Engagement Association, you will have a bunch of new colleagues, even friends, because we are so close. It's a small network of about 120 partners 
and they work in uh, universities. We have more and more young researchers joining us. Uh, they work in cities, in regions, in science foundations. Uh, so you have a very broad network of multidisciplinary engagers who are open and approachable basically any time. So you just talked about FameLab, and that was my uh, one of the early of um, UC experiences that Simon Gage dropped me an email saying, okay, I know you're interested in new formats. Germany doesn't have a fame lab yet. Why don't you set it up? And here's the link. And you know, if you need any support, give me a call. So I set up fame lab based on that in Germany. And today we still have, well, not today in COVID, but until last year, uh, there are about 800, 900 visitors for a fame lab final. So it's very active in our region. We have five cities participating. And that was a result of the UC network, because I wouldn't have known about this at that time when I founded it. Also, the first science festival that I personally did was based on the Edinburgh Science Festival model, which I found really interesting, bringing science to the streets, working with cities, um, not just as a venue where you put up your tents, but as a venue where you have all these like gardens and companies and uh, squares. So that was also a result of the UC network. Now, who are we? We are an alliance of public engagement professionals open to anyone across the world, basically. Uh, we have uh, around 120 members today in uh, Europe and beyond. It's like 27 countries where we are based. Um, and this ranges from um, Iceland to Israel to France. Um, we have Egypt, we have Russia, we have Chinese colleagues who come regularly to join in. We go to China bringing UC members to festivals there. So it's a very, very open network. And what we do is to support innovative engagement strategies and dialogues between science and society. That's basically uh, what we are doing. And to show you one practical example where you may benefit from, that's the platform that Edward already mentioned. It's the UC science engagement platform. Uh, you'll find it via our website and it offers about 50, I think now, different engagement formats, which you may want to take a look at. You'll find references, videos, descriptions on how to do it. We constantly update it based on input from our partners. Uh, so this is uh, something where you may find some relevant uh, resources. There are also some nice reads you will find uh, on the website. Uh, but what is also very important is uh, our annual conference. The next one will be digital, of course. We would have met in Cork and Ireland. This, now we will meet uh, online from 28 till 30 October. So you're all welcome to join this conference. Uh, in times of COVID-19, this international collaboration has been more active than ever before. Because what we all found, and I think this is what you see as well, is that the challenges are the same no matter where you look at. So everybody faces the same challenge of working at home, trying to move everything to the digital space, uh, trying to find new ways to reach out to audiences. So we are closer than ever before. We started two new formats which uh, work quite well. So one is called the UC Bistro, where we get together for a one hour cup of coffee virtually and discuss pressing issues, questions, uh, the specific topics. So People just drop in for an hour, we exchange, and then we drop out again. Then we have a longer format called the UC Hot Pot, which is a, uh, a two-hour gathering with people who bring in ingredients from their different experiences. So this hot pot is longer and more um, intense, but it's always meeting these colleagues who uh, face challenges right now in these crazy times and who share almost everything they have. So in the UC community, there's nothing we wouldn't share with everybody. So you can all make use of this if you're interested. We are, of course, um, involved in a lot of EU projects. So if you want to learn more about uh, this involvement, uh, you can also get in touch because it's always uh, our approach to be uh, part of these international communities in science engagement, in SWAPs, but also in other scientific halls where we start to be more active um, yeah, what else do I want to share? I think the collaboration with China is something that's really interesting because it's broadening our understanding uh, to a new continent with a totally different approach uh, towards engagement, which they used to call science popularization, very different from our engagement and dialogue approach. But we benefit a lot from exchanging this knowledge. Edward can also talk about how we went to Shanghai and talked about 
um, ways to engage multiple publics in workshops, in working groups, uh, uh, in conferences in, uh, in Beijing and in Shanghai. Uh, we had uh, collaborations with South African colleagues in a European network we were engaged in. So we do try to get input also from other networks to see uh, the benefits that we could take up from them. And even in, uh, in China and South Africa, we see some national science engagement strategies that we really like a lot and we can learn a lot from in our European uh, community. So one thing that we learned to sum it up, I think in these COVID-19 times, is not just that we have to move digital. I think this is so basic that, that it's no longer uh, something new. But I think that we need to challenge the way we do science engagement profoundly. And I think what, what we see is that it's no longer enough to promote STEM, which many engagers still uh, try to do. But I think we have to be members of these uh, innovation networks working with um, policymakers, citizens with urban and local uh, developments to get much more embedded into these processes and also involve more disciplines. So it's no longer enough to involve the STEM subjects, but I think we need sociology, we need psychology, we need economy and, and history to really understand what is going on in this world. And I think this is what COVID maybe showed us all, that, that a challenge is never just um, solved by using technology but a challenge needs different answers and we can help uh, provide them because we are so diverse in our network and have these different cultural perspectives as well. So I couldn't read the questions while I was talking. So maybe Jamie, you can help me <laughs> to bring the questions. Uh, yes, totally. Um, so um, Vary is asking if there are priorities for science communication and public engagement across the EU. Uh, so is it that you're trying to uh, pursue research and development? Is it about embedding engagement inside the institutions, culture change? So is there kind of unified uh, goals for engagement across the EU? Um, I think there's some basic unified goals, such as it should be dialogue oriented, there should be a two way transfer in, in the things that we do. So not just promoting something, advertising uh, science, but creating these dialogues. Um, this is, I think, key for all of us. Um, I think the, the, the doing research, for example, is sometimes done in European projects and it's communicated during a conference, but it's not like this basic agreement, this is what we all work on at the same time. So we, I think we try to catch up the new spirits popping up everywhere, the examples and make them accessible to the communities. Uh, but I think what is a big development is this moving away from the STEM only driven uh, notion to train, also to train people. This is also something that we all think is, is very much needed in these times. Yeah, and then to question what we are doing constantly. This is also something that is highly relevant, not just promoting that we need more engagement, but we may need a different form of engagement um, than we did in the past. Okay, if I could just throw a really quick fire uh, question at you, Annette. Um, with Brexit, do you think that EU partners are, are more reluctant to engage with the UK for public engagement and science communication? Or would you say that actually it's not really making a difference. The, the spirit to collaborate is, is still there. If that's not a huge and unfair question. I would say that, I mean, the UK have always been role models for many of us and they stay this way. I mean, they stay to be role models and they are long year colleagues and even friends with a lot of the UK partners. And I don't see any, any single objection to working with the colleagues in the fields. We are not the European Commission with their strange rules and settings, so we don't know uh, how these barriers uh, are being treated in Brussels. But I know from my personal experience that the moment we um, integrate uh, UK colleagues into European projects, which we still do because they are so valuable in their experiences and in the way they work, uh, we always try to find a way and we always found a way so far so there has never been any single barrier in our community to including UK uh, partners. But I think we all agree that UK is the most devastating decision ever made <laughs> in this field. So yeah, but that's nothing we can do about it. But I think the, the relationships are so close over years 
I don't see any barriers there. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure many in the room will be delighted to, to hear that. Um, so, Mahmoud, we're, we're going to come to you in, in just a second. Uh, from the, the kind of practitioner uh, side, you know, you're a researcher who's based in the UK, who has homegrown your own engagement in science communication projects um, to take them further afield the, the, than Europe, for sure. Um, so, Mahmoud, could you tell us a little bit more about what you've managed to, to achieve and the difference between engaging overseas, engaging here from your perspective? Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'll probably share uh, my screen so that uh, you can see some of the things that I will say. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Um, so I'll probably start uh, by sharing my story. I mean, I was uh, born and raised in Nigeria and obviously growing up, uh, you know, there were a lot of challenges that, uh, you know, I came across and it was really difficult to identify uh, who is a role model that you can uh, look out to copy to become a scientist. And uh, apart from that, obviously, these misconceptions affect almost everything that we do. So <clears throat> as a researcher, when I became, again, when I came to the, uh, to the UK, I realized that I could actually do something to change uh, these things. So <clears throat> this is what really led me to join uh, an organization called Trend in Africa in 2013. So Trend in Africa is an NGO and what we do is uh, almost every year we organize science courses. So we have about over 500 uh, alumni across Africa, you know, uh, in the field of neuroscience, you know, the fields, ETC. And uh, what then I was able to use as a, you know, was to kind of use this network to create an outreach network. And why this is really, really crucial is because almost even though Africa is quite heterogeneous, but when you look at places like South Africa, you could say that South Africa is kind of like the Europe of Africa, but the other places are quite, quite far behind as well in other areas of science and technology. And uh, the misconceptions that we find say in Nigeria is probably similar to the misconception that you find in Ghana, in Uganda, ETC. So <clears throat> using this kind of network of alumni that we have in these courses, I established the outreach network. And in this network now we've got uh, participants in over 10 African countries. We organize outreach activities, engage politicians, ETC. And uh, this since 2013 has started to create some impact that is kind of quantifiable. But what is really, really important to know in all these different things that we've been doing is that this is a volunteer based program or like in the UK or in Europe or other places where uh, you've got these dedicated paid positions for public engagement. This is entirely different. We don't really have much paid jobs for public engagement in Africa. Even researchers, it's not really expected of them to kind of uh, communicate their research uh, uh, outputs to the public. So that really kind of affects the engagement that you see with science. So the whole thing that we do is volunteer based, kind of a group of passionate people trying to change things. So in 2018, 2018 I launched the Science Communication of Nigeria and the idea is to have a model somewhere where I would be able to highlight scientists as well as uh, journalists in order to enable the public to be able to kind of engage with real scientists. So in the Science Communication Hub Nigeria website, for example, we have a, a scientist with their contacts ID, ETC, where journalists or the public can actually get in touch with them to talk to them about science. And at the same time, we've got journalists up there as well, which scientists can communicate with to be able to promote their science. And thanks to Welcome Trust in 2019, we launched the African Science Literacy Network. And uh, in this network, uh, given the experience that I've accumulated over the years, I realized that scientists alone, because I'm a scientist fully, I mean, it, it's not enough to be able to do all these things. We need to have the journalists as well. Collaborating together, the impact would be much more uh, better. So we launched this network, and uh, in this network, we, we have fellows, which are usually scientists and journalists working together to kind of promote science, uh, the research that is happening locally, and at the same time also enabling them to engage with international partners. And uh, it, uh, to just conclude, in terms of COVID-19, what we've done with 
African Science Literacy Network, as well as uh, Science Communication of Nigeria, is to launch, for example, a series of webinars that are streamed live on Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. And this is especially because in Africa, a lot of people like to use these networks to kind of engage with people. So we targeted those people to dispel these misconceptions as well as to kind of uh, uh, say more about what the scientific community is doing about that. So that has been so successful quite uh, so far. To conclude, of course, there will be questions that I'll be happy to answer. To conclude, one of the things that I've really come to realize during all these eight years that I've been doing this thing in Africa is that the knowledge of cultural and religious norms and misconceptions are really critical to successful engagement. And at the same time, participation of local scientists and communicators is really, really critical. So oftentimes in terms of pandemics or health crises, when you have people from outside Africa saying things, people are skeptical. They don't really trust that. But when you have a local person really saying something, they feel like there is no conspiracy there, there, there is no uh, agenda. So this is something that I've come to uh, realize. But of course, all those things that I've been doing in the UK has helped in shaping what I've been doing in Africa. Well, obviously, we've heard a lot about what you can do here or in Europe. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so again, if you've got questions, then please do um, leave them in the, the chat. One thing I was, I was wondering if, if you could touch on is, um, let's say we did want to uh, engage you know, further afield, and you've said how important it is to have that understanding of religious and the cultural setting of the communities you're engaging with. What, how could you go about learning, immersing yourself in that culture, or is it about just establishing partners before you initiate a project? How does that learning process begin, would you say? Yeah, I would definitely say that if, uh, as an international uh, person, if you want to establish a project with Africa, then have local partners. Having local partners is really critical because they know what is happening there, and also people there trust them more. So if you have local organizations, then you, are, you will be able to successfully establish something where there will be a bi-directional communication. Okay, we do this, it's gonna work. If you do this, it's probably not gonna work. So that is really, really critical. And uh, apart from that, I would say that at the moment, we don't have so many different organizations doing public engagement in Africa. So oftentimes we either engage with say, uh, media organizations or you engage with university-based organizations. But I have to be honest, uh, it's not always kind of um, exciting because lots of people back there are engaged with other things. Like I said, public engagement is not something that is paid. Researchers, for example, are not really paid to do a public engagement and journalists are more interested in producing stories that would have more clicks. And those stories are usually about politics, about this, about that. So science is really in the back door. So it's something that is, you, one has to appreciate that it's slow, but definitely engage with local partners. If I just have one question to, to each of our panelists, anyone that wants to jump in on this one, um, is lockdown hampering this? I know, Annette, you said that there's been some advantages to it, but is now the time to be starting international collaborations or should we be just waiting because we're so uncertain about what engagement looks like? So that's to any of our panelists, to any of you want to jump in on that. Yeah, if, if I may start, I think it's now or never. I think since everybody really has the same challenge, if someone has a good solution, this is immediately applicable by everyone. So we, we have been talking about moving uh, approaches to the digital sphere or even having hybrid events and now is the time that we can all use whatever pops up all over Europe and even beyond. So if there is a good idea we can all use it in this difficult time and I think uh, I, I could never do public engagement without being international. When I started uh, doing this in Germany about 15 years at least ago uh, Germany still had this attitude that if you do something that is fun it cannot be academic. So for me, without having all these international role models, I would have never started doing what I'm doing. And I think now also we have this very open community in which we can say, oh my God, I'm totally confused. I'm irritated. I don't know how to use it. In our community, you can do that. So it's not this glossy thing. We need to be perfect. 
but we can say, hey, Edward, I'm totally lost. I don't know how to set up my festival. And Edward will right away say, okay, I'm also lost, but let's try to figure out how we can do it together. And that's a wonderful way of working together. And it feels that we are closer, even though we cannot see each other, in some areas we are closer than we've ever been before. And so if you want to be even a member, so to do a little advertisement of our network, you can always join as a member, either as an institution or as an individual scientist and benefit from, from this network. And I would really do that to break up this isolation, which many of us may feel sitting at home, working at home, not being appreciated by peers. And I think this network will encourage you that you're on the same, on a good way forward and that you will find like-minded people. And this is, this is now in these distant times is more important than ever before, I would say. Um, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the COVID-19 pushing us to go digital um, has really meant that um, we, we do, it, it, it actually makes it easier to have these international collaborations because things are digital, it's easy to share these, these things. It, it does require that reaching out and that, you know, dedicate having a dedicated person or some dedicated time to encourage these international links. Because um, it, it, it's difficult to, because they're international, it's difficult to let these things go unless you give them a certain priority, either in terms of your time or other people's you, you manage time. I, I think that's, that's really, really key. Another point I, I wanted to mention was um, before COVID-19 happened, I gave a remote workshop, for example, to a group of researchers in South Africa as part of an EU project. It was done um, remotely um, and uh, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, Mahmoud, because it, it showed me how we share a lot of the same difficulties. Um, in Malta, you don't get much science funding. You don't have many dedicated pub public engagement jobs. I'm technically an academic and I dedicate a lot of my time in order to do this. Um, and uh, we have 10 years ago, the director of the University of Malta said research was Malta's best kept secret. <laughs> now, hopefully that's changed a bit, but um, it's really nice to see these shared problems and values. Uh, and just to go back on that workshop that I gave remotely, I ended up learning more from the people I was giving the workshop for because the responsiveness, so the EU right now is pushing a lot for involving citizens through every step of the research process and research being done for the needs of society. Um, that awareness of that was really strong in South Africa. This was a group of marine researchers and um, the values they had and the eagerness they had to work with fishermen, government authorities, and to have an impact so the research gets an impact was uh, really strong and something that I, I really enjoyed seeing. Um, but just before we, we wind up, um, Varys put a, a question in the chat box that I did want to um, come to, which is to ask you how Scott Penn can help or the role that Scott Penn plays. So Scott Penn, uh, uh, an organization that is helping fostering, sharing experience of engagement across Scotland, a network of engagement professionals and researchers who are interested in engagement. What would be your ask of us if you had one? What role can Scotland play in the kind of international sphere? Do you want um, our voice, our expertise, our partnerships? Can you see where we fit in? So if you had an ask of Scotland, Mahmoud, Annette or Edward, what would it be? I mean, I would, I would recommend to, to enter the discussion um, as a kind of critical friend, having so much experience over so many years, much longer than many other countries in Europe. And you could enter the discussion uh, at UC uh, in panels, bringing in sessions and providing your input uh, and reflecting on what you see is happening with your long-term experience. That would be something uh, we would be really interested in. We had some trainings in the UK sphere, like in the uh, Welcome Genome Campus in, in Cambridge, where they invited different uh, speakers from UC and from different networks to reflect on where they are in training their researchers. So we can have these very practical collaborations and trainings uh, exchanging speakers. But I think as a network, for example, in the next UC conference, we have a panel on the future of public engagement. And it could be interesting to have some Scott Penn representatives 
uh, bringing in their feedback into what is happening from your perspective. So it could be a two-way exchange. So we had uh, memorandums of understanding with uh, neighbor networks. Uh, so this could be an option. So I think there are multiple ways of, of getting together, but I think being practically involved in the network is the best thing you can do. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely say that this is, uh, I mean, uh, kind of Scott Penn can get involved in the different things that we do as well in Africa. And uh, I kind of like to think about it from uh, the angle that they, you know, people in that network will learn as well as people in our network will learn. So it's a bi-directional flow of information uh, and uh, knowledge exchange. I remember when we went to establish the African Science Literacy Network, I went with, the, with some colleagues in the University of West England, uh, Creek Institute and other institutions, and uh, they were excited seeing how things can be entirely different from what they used to know. And uh, I saw as part of the African Science Literacy Network, for example, we are thinking more about how to uh, organize activities to bring professionals to engage with the journalists as well as scientists to see how that can enhance their activities, but at the same time also uh, the speakers learning more about their activities. So I'll be really happy to have people uh, get involved in that if at all uh, you, know, you are happy to uh, collaborate. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you to our panel. Thank you for everyone for joining us. I hope Scott Penn Annual Gathering has gone fantastically well um, for all of you and that you've had a, a great time and you have uh, discovered new ideas and you're enthusiastic about engagement going forward. Um, so from me, a final thank you and goodbye. Hope to see you soon. See you at the Friday Social. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.